John chapter 12. I was reading this story today. You know, we, we, we preach about Palm Sunday every year, and we've heard it preached a thousand times. Something jumped out at me, though, when I read it this week, and it, and it shifted the way I was going to go today. It took me back to the basics, if you will, and it's in John chapter 12. It starts at verse 20. It says, and there were certain Greeks that came to worship at the feast. The same came, therefore, to Philip, which was of Bethsaida of Galilee, and desired him, saying, Sir, we would see Jesus. Philip cometh and telleth Andrew. And Andrew and Philip told Jesus. When Jesus heard them, he said, The hour has finally come that the Son of Man should be glorified. I want to preach to you this morning about 20 minutes on this subject. We would see Jesus. We would see Jesus. Let's pray. Father, today we thank you for your infallible word. God, I pray that you move me out the way. Put me in whatever key you want to hear. Step up here in my place. Speak to your people. Open up the ears of the church so they can hear what they thus saith the Lord. We give you glory and honor. We have an expectation and we receive every word. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. You can be seated. We would see Jesus. You know, whatever captures your attention will control your life. Whatever you seek, you will follow. Whatever you focus your mind on will control your feet, and you will go in that direction. We're looking at this story today, and Jesus is entering Jerusalem on his way to the cross. There's a multitude of people, and we always see the people as the crowd being full of uh, Jewish people from the community and from that area of the world, coming to see the coming king, the Messiah that they have been waiting on. But the story I read to you today is about some Greek men and women that were in the crowd. They were not necessarily supposed to be there. They were not necessarily part of the, the church lingo, if you will. And they went and they said these words, we would see Jesus. You know, the same is true today. We, we have a lot of people in the church today. Many come to be spectators. They come to see what this preacher sounds like when he talks. We have some people that come in as, as skeptics. Is this God really real? We have some people come in and they are hypocrites. I always say, where else are we going to go? Some are doubters. But in the midst of all that show up here today, I believe that there is a remnant few that came for the right reason. And that is to worship the living God. Because when you come to church to worship, you're not worried about who's got on what and who's doing who. When you come to worship, you don't care if the children's choir doesn't hit all the right notes all the time. When you come to church to worship, you don't care if you don't come in and get your regular seat that you sit in every Sunday. Because when you come to church to worship, you understand that you didn't come to worship the church. You came to worship the Lord of the church. We are not here today to be entertained by charisma. But we are here to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And his name is Jesus. I wonder if there's anybody in here today that came to worship. These men were Greeks. And they knew that Jesus was worthy to be worshipped. So they said, sir, we would see Jesus. I want to see him. You know, as I studied this this week, I, I started to feel an uneasiness in my spirit about the state of the churches in our world today. Have we been consistent with the presentation of the gospel? We preach about prosperity. We preach about becoming a better person. And all of those things are important. All of those things are even biblical. But have we gotten so proficient at preaching the principles of the Bible that we fail to preach Jesus? It's a melancholy truth that we have begun to focus more on the blessings of being a believer than sometimes we misplace the one in whom we believe. There has to be a cry from the depths of our souls as believers that we would see Jesus. 
It's necessary to have a church home. It's important to have sound doctrine and teaching. There's a place for traditions and practices in the church. All those things are important, but as important as they are, we cannot let ourselves get so caught up in all of those things that we forget to worship the head of the church, which again is Jesus Christ our Lord. It's not the church, it's not the church that saves the lost. It's not the church that uh, changes a man's heart. Pro pro protocol doesn't heal the sick and raise the dead. It is because of the blood of the righteous Lamb of God, and his name is Jesus. Second Corinthians, the Bible says, For our sake he made himself to be sin, who knew no sin, so that we in him might become the righteousness of God. I can go downstairs in our baptism and baptize you with water, but Jesus has another baptism. Matthew chapter 3 says, I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that cometh after me is mightier than I whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Jesus has a baptism that is Holy Ghost and it is fire. Anybody ever been baptized in a Holy Ghost and fire here today? I can preach the word of God to your ears, but it is Jesus that uses the word to penetrate your heart. Hebrews chapter 4 says the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit and the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of men. He is our rock and our salvation. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. He's not looking for religion. He's looking for relationship. Too many people want the blessings, but they don't want Jesus. They want to have prosperity, but they don't want Jesus. They want the power, but they don't want Jesus. But I came to serve notice to somebody today that if you have been waiting on a breakthrough in your life, it's not going to come from you reaching, reading no, no, no self-help self -help book or going to a conference. If you want God to deliver you, you have to be in his presence. We would see Jesus. This is why the songwriter wrote, oh, how I love Jesus. Why? Because he first loved me. I know that you think that it was you that came down to the altar that day. I know that you think it was you that gave your heart to the Lord. But no, it was the Lord that pulled you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It was he that woke you up that morning and put church on your heart. It was he that saved you from death, hell, and the grave. It was he that didn't let you get addicted when you tried it the first time. Come on, somebody. Somebody. It was him. You think that it was on you, but it was the Lord that dropped us out of this. He's the one that wrapped his love around us. He's the one that poured his mercy down our throat and wrapped us in his grace and stood us up straight and said, go out and live another day. That's the God that we serve. And he tells us to continually seek him. I want to say we would see Jesus. Hebrews chapter 11, he says, what, without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to him must first believe that he is, and he is a rewarder to them that diligently seek him. He says, I don't want you to seek me because I'm hard to find. I want you to seek me because you need to seek me. Because when you seek me, you are reminded that you need me. I believe that we have to get back to seeking Jesus this morning. Even on Palm Sunday, Lord, we would see Jesus. We as a church should never be satisfied with anything less than the fresh fire of the Holy Ghost on the altar of our hearts. Saying, Lord, I didn't come here to be seen today. I didn't fight my way to church today to be cute. But God, I came here because I need a fresh touch from you. Anybody need a fresh touch today? I know it may be some people in here or people uh, that, that's watching online that you just came here just to stop by on your way to breakfast. But there are a few of us in here that really came to worship the Lord. I need you to touch me. I need you to speak to me, Lord. We would see Jesus. Last week was good, but it's not good enough for my tomorrow. I didn't come here today to join into praise because the truth is, if the choir never sang me happy, if they never hit B flat, I'm still going to praise God. If, if the preacher don't preach me into a shout, I'm going to shout anyway because he's been too good to me to let me sit on my hands. If I don't praise him, the rocks will cry out. 
This is why the old saints used to say this. I love this. When you a real praiser, you don't need no praise team. All you need is a memory. Because when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, sometimes you're waiting on him to give you a shout for what he's about to do, but every now and then, you ought to remember what he has already done. He said, I must be lifted up. That's the Jesus that we preach. We must make sure that we always preach Jesus and him crucified. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He didn't say lift your church up. He didn't say lift your pastor up. He didn't say lift your religion up. No, he said lift me up. Talk about me when you testify. When you tell people you got that job, tell them I'm the one that gave it to you. You knew you weren't qualified for that job. You talk about the house that you got. I'm the one that gave it to you. I told the underwriter to give it to you. You know your credit was jacked up. Come on, somebody. You need to remember where you came from and it makes you seek him. It's the God that we serve that wants to love us and he wants to be in relationship. And he said, when you lift me up, that's when I'll send revival to your house. You trying to, trying, to, trying to put things in order and put and plan and implement things. Yeah, do that, but make sure that you lift him up. Because when you lift him up, he said, I'll bring revival to your house. I'll bring the people to the church. You need to have structure. You need to have a plan. But all of those things are so you can handle the blessings when they come. But the only way that the blessings will come in your life is he has to be lifted up. We would see Jesus. We won't stand for anything less. I don't, I don't want to stand for anything less. These men and these women said, we want personal time with him. I don't want you just to tell me how good he is, but take me to him. It's nice to meet you. Now take me to Jesus. I appreciate your ministry, but take me to Jesus. See, we need to stop thinking that we are so impressive and, 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 and so awesome sometimes. You know why? Because we can get so self-absorbed that when people come to church, they can't get to Jesus because the church is in the way. But our prayer ought to be, God, move us out the way. Don't let us impress our people with our services and our musical selections. We strive to represent you the best way that we can. We do everything that we do in excellence. But don't let our gifts and our talents take the attention off you. We would see Jesus, I appreciate how you do your services. The smoke screen and the, the light shows, they are very impressive. But if I come to your place of worship, and if all I see are the lights and the cameras, and I don't see Jesus, it's all for nothing. My brothers, I can see you this morning. I appreciate how you just came from the barber shop. You got the enhancements going and the line is looking real crispy, my brother. I appreciate you looking the best that you can look. And to all my sisters, I appreciate you taking care of yourself too. You got your hair done and your nails did at the same time. And in a few weeks, you're going to be able to have your toes out and show off your pedicure because it's going to be summertime. But as beautiful as the people of God are, I didn't come here this morning to see you. I came here to see Jesus. We would see Jesus. We don't need to see another preacher. We don't need to see another praise leader. Our hearts cry have to always be from the depths of our souls. We would see Jesus. If I can see Jesus, I can make it through the test that I'm going through. If I can see Jesus, my child is going to get saved. If I can see Jesus, deliverance is going to come to my house. I wonder if I got anybody in here who's on the same page with me this morning. Who can say, yeah, all of those things are important. I'm not saying that they're not important. All those things are even necessary, but after you get done with all of that, make sure that I can see Jesus. If I preach a sermon that goes viral and get a million views and I don't lead somebody to Jesus, it's all for nothing. If you write a book and become a best-selling author but don't lead people to Jesus, it is all for nothing. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and him crucified. Paul was a highly educated man, intelligent, deep spiritual convictions. God spoke directly to him. He wrote most of the New Testament. But he said none of those things even matter. 
None of those things can compare to the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 1, verse 16, he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Jesus is the gospel personified. It is the power of God unto salvation. Now that word salvation is all-inclusive. It means healing for the body, deliverance for those that are in bondage, and true prosperity. I'm not talking about that name and claim it garbage. I'm talking about true prosperity. You see, we don't just need the gospel to be saved from death, but we need it, the gospel so we can live this life on earth. And the gospel is this. He said that he died that we might live. But not only did he die, but three days later he rose with all power in his hand. This is the Jesus that we preach, and he must be presented to the people by his disciples. We would see Jesus. To the ones lost in sin, they see him on a cross, paying the penalty for sin. That sin belongs to them, but he says, I'm going to pay it for you. To the ones that are sick, they see him being wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes, we are Healed. The dying, they see him as risen from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father. Now, they don't have to worry about death because to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. We would see Jesus. Without Jesus, there is no good news. Why is it that we suffer from not having a revival in our world today? People are struggling so much, they want a revival. Lord, bring revival. Why is it that we can't have revival? It's because people cannot see Jesus. They're stuck on social media. They're, they're stuck on the light shows. They're, they're stuck on the pump, on the, on the, on the pump and the, the, the things that people are doing. And it's so big and it's so magnanimous. I can't see past all of that. All of that things are necessary. They're, they're good. I love it. But at the end of the day, can I see Jesus? I love how you operate in excellence. I, I love how you keep us interested and inspired but I want to see Jesus he has to be the center of attention he has to be the main event the Bible says that these Greek men and women they came to worship and they were foreigners they walked in the church and they had never been to church before they didn't know when to lift their hands they didn't know when to praise him or sit down they didn't know when to slap somebody a high five or, or when to give the offering they didn't know the songs, they didn't know what to do, but all they knew is that they wanted to see Jesus. That has to be the hunger today, the cry that we need, even on this Palm Sunday. I know we're supposed to be talking about the palms. I know we're supposed to be talking about the haters in the crowd. But I came to tell you, there is no power in the crowd. There's no deliverance in the crowd. These men and women, they had it right. They didn't come for the show and not the Savior. They didn't want the power without his presence. Brothers and sisters, we are remembering today when Jesus had his triumphal entry into Jerusalem on his way to the cross. Some people came there to be nosy. They had heard that he raised Lazarus from the dead. They wanted to see who this man was. But these select men and women represented a, a remnant few whose desire was not what Jesus could do for them. But they just wanted to be in his presence. What, what's so special about his presence? Psalm 16, it says, In thy presence is the fullness of joy, and at thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. His presence is what brings joy. It's not some man or some woman. It's not money and it's not drugs. His presence is what brings joy. His presence is what brings peace. This is our year of transformation. How does this relate to transformation? We've been learning about transformation all year. I've been teaching everything that God has given me to you. I've given you things to implement. I've given you things to practice. And we can put all of the effort in on our own. We can implement the strategies and, and put, do the practical things. But none of that matters if we don't have his presence. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But we all, with unveiled face, Beholding as in the mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the Lord. It's when we behold his glory that we become transformed. You have to, we would see Jesus. These Greek men and women, they wanted to see Jesus, but not only did they want to see his face, they wanted to hear his voice. They wanted to look into his eyes. 
They wanted to converse with him and hear him speak the word of God. They had heard that men were changed after they saw him. I don't know about you, but a testimony is powerful. If you've been in the presence with Jesus, you ought to tell somebody about it. Soldiers were sent to arrest him and they came back saying, no man has ever spoke like this before. Professional fishermen that saw him came back saying, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the waves obey him? Religious leaders would see him and came back saying, what is this that he commands the devils and the unclean spirits and even they obey him? A centurion saw him dying on the cross, came back saying, truly, this is the son of God. These men and women had heard the testimony of people and they said in their hearts, I love you, but take me to Jesus. We would see Jesus. If you look for him, you will see him. He was a tree of life at the Garden of Eden. He was Abel's sacrifice and Noah's ark of salvation. He was Abraham's ram and the place of Isaac. He was Israel's Passover lamb that protected them from the death angel in Egypt. He divided the Red Sea with Moses' rod. He's Gideon's sword and the stone in David's slingshot. He was Daniel's lion tamer and the fourth man in the furnace. He was Zechariah's fountain of cleansing, open in the house of David. This is why we can sing the song that said, There is a fountain filled with blood, drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stain. He was Malachi's son of righteousness with healing in his wings. He's the rose of Sharon. He's the bright and morning star. He's the alpha and the omega. He's the beginning and the ending. He's the king of kings and he's the lord of lords. And somebody is looking at me today saying, there he go again preaching about who Jesus is. Don't he come up with some other material, baby? Let me tell you, if preaching Jesus is going to offend you, then I am not the preacher for you. Because I refuse to speak the wisdom of men. I don't get up here every week to inspire you. I don't have an inspirational message. I'm not trying to teach you how to get rich or die trying. But all I got for you is Jesus. For him I live and for him I die. And there is no other name that is given among men whereby we must be saved. We would see Jesus. Come on and put your hands together. Don't you put your faith in man. Don't you put your hope in people. Because my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. You don't got to be a good person to come to him. You don't have to have a good reputation to come to him. He will never love you any less than he already loves you. And he will never love you any more than he already loves you. It's already maxed out. There's nothing that we can do to disappoint God. All you got to do is say, Lord, I want to see you. I have to have a desire to see him. God, let the church get out of the way so everybody in this cold and bitter world can see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what today is really about, people of God. It's about the Lord and Savior that came riding in on a donkey. He was the king that came to set up his kingdom. He, he told, they told Jesus, why don't you tell these people to keep quiet? Jesus said, if I tell them to be quiet, then the rocks are going to cry out. The rocks are going to cry. I don't want no rocks to, to cry out for me. Up until this point, Jesus would heal people and tell them not to tell nobody. He would touch them and say, now go your way and keep your, your mouth closed. But on this day, he said, I'm going to be the center of attention. I want the world to know who I really am because my time has come. Save us, they said. They waved the palms at him. They got the palms out and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. You know what Hosanna means? It means, Lord, save us. And every time we wave our hands, every time we lift up a praise, we are saying, Lord, save us. I know that there's some jacked up people in this world, but it's me, oh Lord, that is standing in the need of prayer. I know that five days later, it was going to be some people that flipped the script. I know five days later, they were going to be saying crucify him. But I don't believe that everybody in that crowd gave up hope and twisted to the other side. I believe that there were some people on that Palm Sunday morning that were waving the palms with a sincere heart. They said, Lord, I'm going to be with you. With you, I'm going to stand. Is there anybody in here today who can say, I'm going to praise him today? And even five days later, when people are crucifying him, when people are beating him and talking about him, I'm not going to deny him. That's my Lord and my Savior. He's looking for people that are faithful today. And do you know what? There's going to come a day when he comes back again to save his church. 
The Bible says that the dead in Christ will rise first. And then us that remain, we will greet them in the air and we will be forever with the Lord. And did you know that there's going to be another palm service coming? Did you know that there's going to be a day when we're going to get to raise our palms up too? Revelations chapter 7 verse 9. It says, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could number. That's us y'all. Of all nations. That's us y'all. Of all tribes. That's us y'all. Of all peoples. That's us. Of every tongue standing therefore before the throne of the Lamb clothed with white robes and they're going to be waving their palms in their hands saying, Lord, thank you that I made it through to the other side. We bless God for the saints that have gone on before us. We thank God that they paved the way for us. But on that bad day when Jesus comes back, I'm not going to be left here to try and figure things out. I'm not going to give up my palm. I'm going to praise God today, whether you like it or not, and I'm going to preach Jesus to the day I die. In Jesus' name. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand of praise. We have to remember that Jesus has to be the center of attention. When you take your palm home today, I want you to put it on the doorpost of your house or put it on the, on the front of your car. So everywhere you go, you're giving God praise. Every time you come home, you're reminded to give God praise. Jesus said, if they shut up, the rocks are going to cry out. I'm not going to let no rocks cry out for me. It don't matter what's going on in my life. I'm going to praise him. While I got a reasonable portion of health in my body, I'm going to praise him. If I'm the only one that shows up on Sunday morning, guess what? I'm still going to praise him. Why? Because he is worthy to be praised. From the rising of the sun to the going down of the same sun, he is worthy to be, no matter what the circumstances is. If I ain't got no money, I'm going to bless his name. If people talk about me, I'm going to bless his name. If I ain't got no money, I'm going to bless his name. If the phone don't ring, I'm going to bless his name. Why? Because we serve a God who is worthy, not because of what's going on in our life, but because of who he is. We would see Jesus. Come on, put your hands together. Give the Lord a hand praise. The Bible says in the book of Psalms, one thing have I desired of the Lord. Stand to your feet. I'm done. I'm going to close with this scripture. One thing have I desired of the Lord. That will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty. We would see Jesus, to inquire in his temple. And now shall my eyes be lifted up above my enemies round about me. Therefore, I will offer in his tabernacle sacrifice of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises to the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you. 